Are you thinking of opening up your own Pilates studio? Are you perhaps a Pilates teacher that has had enough of working for other people and want to venture out on your own, but you're not quite sure how to go about it? Or maybe you are a Pilates enthusiast that loves the session so much that you want to actually invest into the industry. So how do you go about owning your own Pilates business? So in this week's video, I'm going to go through the different types of Pilates businesses that you can run. And I'm going to go through all the options so you can identify what these type of businesses are and which option would be more suitable for you in venturing out into your new business venture. For those who don't know me, my name is Anita Hori. I am founder of Anita Hori Academy. I'm second generation Pilates master teacher. I have got 30 years of business experience, 20 years in the Pilates industry, and I am here to serve you. So before we jump into the two types of businesses that you can run as a Pilates teacher, I just want to clarify that running your own Pilates business is not an easy task. Pilates businesses are like any other businesses, so if you have no skills, no business skills, then you are destined for failure. Now, interestingly enough, this week I posted a post on the new Pilates teachers and studio owners growth forum on Facebook asking that, that exact question. What skills do you think you need to run a decent Pilates business? So I've had all sorts of comments from decent coaching to patients to creating your own boundaries. But really, truly, and essentially, running a business needs all that, needs all this. But you also need to know how to run a business as a business. And that involves understanding the formations of a business and what implications that would have to you in your personal life. So that being said, the two types of businesses that a Pilates teacher would normally open as a Pilates business owner would be either a Pilates sole trader or sole proprietor, so you're running the business on your own, or as a limited company. And if you haven't been in business and you haven't run businesses before, you wouldn't really understand what implications there are for each one. Now, remember, I have a background in accountancy. I am a certified accountant, and I am here to give you a distinction between the two types of businesses but I'm only going to go through a general overview of what the two types of businesses are going to be. And if you're really wanting tax advice and you're wanting to see exactly how to set up your Pilates studio or Pilates business in your country, I would really recommend that you speak to a local accountant who knows the local laws and who knows how to go about setting your business up in your area. In saying that, Thankfully, the principles for a sole trader and a limited company are quite similar in many Western countries. There are maybe changes in tax laws, there are maybe simple changes in the way that you process uh, the administration part of it, but then the general overview is very similar. Hence, I want to go through this video to give you the nuts and bolts of these two types of businesses and then you could make an educated choice on running your own. So the most common way of teachers running their Pilates businesses is a sole trader or a sole proprietor. This means that you are running your business without having a separate legal entity. So you're running it as your own, as yourself. So there's no separation from your personal business to your actual business, to your work. So here's a quick explanation to what this means in the Pilates teacher's context. The first thing is that as a sole trader or sole proprietor, you are going to have full control of decision making. So you don't have to consult with anyone else as to how to run your business. You can make your plans for your marketing, for your sales, and even for whatever expenditure you have, you can take full control of that. You don't have to consult with anybody else. This also gives you that flexibility because then you don't need to be working towards specific guidelines or specific rules as to how to run the business. So there's that flexibility involved and also you've got full control of your business. The other thing is that it requires a very simple setup and registration. 
So whether you're in the UK, in the US or even in Europe, there are simple strategies that you need to take to take the step to becoming self-employed. So the first thing is that you have to register yourself as a self-employed person. So you might need a tax number. Obviously, this also going to be depending on the country that you're living in. I know that in the UK, you need to contact the HMRC and in Europe, you would need to contact your local tax authorities to register for a tax number and also to register as a self-employed. Now, in all countries, you would need to be paying into some kind of social security system, regardless of whether it is private or public, there is a social security payment that needs to be done. So this is again, something that you need to consider looking at when you are speaking to your accountant. So you have to also budget for that when you are running your business. And that would become as part of one of your costs when you're running your business, you need to know that one of your deductions is going to have to be your social security contributions. Now, in majority of the countries that we operate in, there is some sort of sales tax that we have to pay as businesses. So in Europe, it would be the value added tax. And depending on the country that you're in, there might be a sales threshold. So you might not even need to be registered for the VAT for your sales tax until you actually reach a certain amount of sales. So that would be an advantage to you. So you know that your first X amount of um, sales are not going to be incurring a VAT. However, again, I'm going to reiterate this. You need to clarify all this with your accountant. In the US, different states have different sales taxes. Again, it's really, really important to identify all this information with your accountant. But going back to the structure of being self-employed, so the first thing you do is you register yourself for your taxes. If you register yourself as a self-employed, and then obviously if you need to register yourself for sales tax, you also need to do that within this process. Now the setup is so simple and the administration is so low that there isn't such a huge burden on you having to separate your personal and your business expenses. I mean, of course, you are going to need to keep separate records and you need to make sure that you know for your own sake that there is a profitability in the business. But as far as the burden to the authorities is concerned, it's not so high as, for example, the counterpart, a limited company, then you need to then consider something different. We're going to be talking about that in a second. But the burden on you as a sole proprietor and a sole trader to be managing your expenses and your accounts is going to be a little bit less. So you, it's a little bit more relaxed. It's a more relaxed system. And of course, regardless of whichever country you're living in, you have to fill in and submit your personal tax return. And that would be different according to the country you're living in. Now that and the social security contributions have to be paid, the taxes and the social security contributions have to be paid. Again, that would be something you need to discuss with either the local tax authorities, if you want to really avoid costs with an accountant, or if you want to feel that you've got peace of mind, speak to an accountant. And you know, you could also have a bookkeeper that would help you to do this. So you don't necessarily have to work with a fully fledged certified accountant. If you have somebody who already knows the way that the system runs, then you can also work with a bookkeeper. My advice is always to go with the professionals because there might be some loopholes that your tax accountant can help you with. And of course, that's going to be beneficial for you and for your business. When it comes to financial liabilities and responsibilities, being a sole trader can actually be a disadvantage. Why? Because as a sole trader, there's no actual distinction between you and your business. So if there is a liability and if there's an accident or something that happens in your studio or in your business and anybody, any one of your clients decides to sue you, then actually there's no distinction between you and your business. So they're going to sue you personally. And that's why it's very important to get your insurances sorted out and to make sure that you are a fully fledged and legitimate professional business. So you know you're doing things the right way. I'm not saying that you should go out there and go and open up a company, but no, just make sure that you are covered as a sole proprietor. And many, many, many teachers run like this. 
for the first few years of um, running their businesses. And as a sole proprietor, your financials and the management of your financials runs the same way as your personal financials. So what I'm saying is that if you are calculating your business profits, the whole of your profits are passed on to you as your wage and your salary. You don't need to be drawing a wage and a salary out of your business. Now, of course, I would always recommend that you would have a guide as to what your salary should be out of your business because at the end of the day, you are running your business as a business, as a profitable entity. So what you don't want to be doing is running a business, paying your Pilates teachers or maybe paying whoever else is working for you and then ending up with a very low profit, meaning that that is your wage, that's your salary. Is it really what you're worth? So always consider that when you're doing your financials or when you're running your profit and loss and when you're doing your budget. And the other good thing is that you can claim business related expenses against your personal income tax. So that's also going to reduce your tax liability at the end of the year. So this is something that you again have to talk to your accountant about and see in your country, in your state, what business expenses are tax deductible and uh, very different tax deductibles in different countries. So I really would suggest you speak to a professional about this. Then when it comes to banking, although it's really highly recommended and I truly recommend you keep a separate bank account for your business so that you know exactly what your business income and expenditure is, there's no legal requirement for you to do so as a sole proprietor. So you could have one bank account and run your personal expenses from it and also your business expenses. Again, I would not recommend it. I think you're going to get yourself into a huge mess if you do that. But As a legal requirement, it is not actually obligatory. So you can, if you wanted to, just keep it nice and simple and have one bank account and less bank fees. So I wanna go through a quick, simple scenario so that you get the gist of running a business as a sole trader. So say, for example, Sarah here is um, wanting to open up her Pilates business as a sole trader. So she's going to go ahead and register herself with her local authorities. If she's in the UK, she can even register with the HMRC online and then she receive her UTR, which is her unique tax reference. And then she goes and sets up a dedicated business bank account and purchases necessary insurance, including public liability insurance. She then rents a space in a local studio to hold her classes and offers private sessions in her clients' homes and also in her own home. She creates a website, uses social media to promote her services and joins local fitness and wellness groups to network with and obviously to increase her sales. Sarah keeps detailed records of her income from classes and expenses like studio rent, equipment and marketing costs. She uses accounting software to help manage her finances. Then at the end of the year, Sarah completes her self-assessment tax return, reports her income and pays the necessary tax and national insurance. So by following these steps, Sarah successfully runs her Pilates business as a sole trader or sole proprietor, enjoying the benefits of being her own boss while carefully managing her responsibilities and liabilities. Now let's move on to the second scenario. So let's say that we're interested in opening up a Pilates studio as a limited company. What conditions do we look out for and what does opening up a Pilates studio, our Pilates business as a limited company, what does that mean? So here's a detailed explanation of what it involves in being a limited company and perhaps how to set up a limited company in your country. So the first thing is limited liability. As I just mentioned, there is a separate legal entity from the shareholders of the company. So when there is a company set up, people who own the company are called shareholders and these shareholders are protected, which means that if anything happened, they have limited liability, unlike the sole proprietor, which would have full liability for anything that happened. They would generally be liable to the company's debts up to the amount that they've actually invested in the company. So this structure is really beneficial for mitigating any personal risk, personal financial risk associated with running the business. Now, the legal and administrative requirements are very different. In the UK, in Europe and in the US, 
and I'm sure in many other countries, the company has to be registered. So when you run a business as a limited company, you need to register your business and you need to register your limited company with the relevant authorities. In the UK, it is Companies House, and in the US, it's typically the Secretary of State. And the name of the business must be unique and must adhere to specific name requirements. So if you ask for ask a consultant for guidance on how to open up your Pilates business, and the first thing they ask you is, let me just check and see whether your name is going to be registered yet or your name's able, we're able to use this name as your business, that would give you a hint that actually they're looking to set your business up as a limited company. And be aware of this because I know in many countries there are consultants that are trying to sell or to set up businesses as limited companies because obviously they'll be able to get a bigger fee and then you change your structure to a limited company, which means that it's going to have bigger administrative implications for you. So check it out. Just make sure that you are opening your business as the right setup. So with a limited company, they have to have the name adherence. So it's very important for them to check your name and see that it's not already registered as a limited company. Now, if you're opening a limited company, you need to set up articles of incorporation. So these are legal documents that are going to be outlining the purpose of your business and how it's going to be run. So it's a legal document that has to be set up and normally you would need this people like lawyers or even accountants to help you set up these documents to be able to file to the relevant authorities. The articles of incorporation also outline the structure of your company. So that would mean how many shareholders are in the company, who they are and what percentage of shares do they own. So you can see it's a lot more complicated than just opening up a business and just running with it. The other thing with a limited company is that there are tax, different tax implications. In a limited company, you would be paying corporation tax. So as well as paying your own personal income tax, the company or the entity itself is going to be paying its own tax, its corporate tax. So most of the time, actually, corporate tax can be lower than personal income tax. And that's why many businesses, and especially it really depends on the way that they want to structure the business. But if there are, there's a company that wants to set up a chain of Pilates studios, it is much better for them to run the business as a limited company because that would incorporate one company that has different studios and that all will fall under the same umbrella. It makes it a little bit easier and cheaper in the long term to run a company like that. And the other huge tax implication of a corporate company, of a limited company, would be that a limited company would be paying out salaries and dividends. So as a director, as an employee, you would be earning your own salary, of which you would be paying personal income tax, but then you would also be getting dividends at the end of the year from the profits that you make. And most of the time in many countries, the dividends have got much better tax advantages than just personal income tax. Something else to weigh in when you are considering the two. Now, the one huge distinction from a limited company to a sole proprietor is the accounts filing. So you have to keep separate accounts. The limited company must have its own bank account separate to your personal accounts. This is a legal requirement and also financial accounts. So you need to be doing profit and loss accounts separate for the company, showing exactly what your turnover is and what your costs are and then what your profits are because limited companies get audited. Limited companies get audited by auditors, which means that you're going to be incurring extra fees every year for your accounts to be audited. So that's where you would have to weigh in all the costs associated to having your accounts audited versus whatever tax advantages that you might have from running a limited company. Now, if your intention is to grow your business and venture out into other businesses and you're seeking growth, you want to perhaps partner with other companies, 
Running a limited company is going to give you better credibility when it comes to dealing with third parties. They could see that you're running your business as a professional entity, that you are really taking your work seriously, and then they know that they could easily do business with you. So this would be advantageous if you are having to deal with clients, suppliers, and also investors. So if your intention is to grow and to get into further partnerships with other people, this might be a very good opportunity to consider going into a limited company. The other big thing is that you could easily get more capital as a limited company. So if you're looking for investors, or you're looking to get loans from banks, etc., or even getting yourself a company car, it would be much easier for you to get credit because you are running a limited company. And yes, sometimes you say, well, it doesn't make sense. You know, why would I run a limited company just to get a, a car on a loan on HP or whatever that might be? It's because Limited companies are given more credit with banks than a sole trader. And then likewise, investors are going to be more inclined to invest into a limited company because of the limited liability protection. So let's take another typical example and just imagine that Alex wants to open up a limited company as a Pilates business. So the first thing that he does is to make sure that he registers a unique company name and that complies with the local regulations. Now, if he's in the UK, he would register that with the company's house and he has to file the articles of association and the memorandum of association. Whereas in the US, he would need to register with the secretary of state in the state where he's operating in. And of course, he would need to file articles of incorporation and operating agreement if that is required. He has to obtain a local business license from the local municipality, and then he has to ensure that the studio complies with local health and safety regulations. He then has to open a bank account, a separate bank account for the company. Implementing an accounting system, he has to make sure that his accounting system is one that is acceptable by the local authorities and the system can manage finances and ensures that compliance with financial reporting requirements. He has to take out public liability insurance to protect against claims of injury or damage by clients, staff or third parties. He also has to take professional liability insurance covering claims related to professional advice or services provided. Then, of course, he has to create a business plan to outline marketing analysis, financial projections and a marketing strategy, especially if he's looking to get investors for his business. Once he recruits his staff and trains people, then he needs to equip the studio. And of course, if he is registered as a limited company, he's going to be much more able to get loans for equipment or investment of any other sort for his business, such as property rent or property lease or maybe property purchase. So when we look at these two types of business and we're trying to identify which one of them is going to be the most suitable for us, what would be the key considerations for us to consider? So a sole trader, sole proprietor situation is more suitable for someone who wants to start up small, who perhaps is a person who works from different studios or goes to people's homes or even has people coming to their own home studio. This would be a much quicker, much easier form of setup to operate as a Pilates business. Then a limited company structure is going to be a lot more suited for those who want to go big on their investments. They want to have separate different locations. They want to have multiple teachers and invest heavily on equipment and property. This would definitely be more suitable as a limited company because we are looking at a much larger structure. And then when you think of the financial projections, the sole trader has a lot less initial investment in their business. You know, they don't need to be starting their business with tens of thousands of dollars. And it's a lot more, it's a lot simpler as a process to just set up. And in comparison, the limited company has much higher setup costs it involves a lot more rigorous steps to be able to set up and of course requires more investments. However, it improves your possibilities for gaining more capital through investments. And when it comes to the long-term growth goals, with a sole proprietor structure, as we know, it's much easier to set up. However, 
when it comes to scalability and growth, you might start to face some limitations because people are not going to be so keen in investing with you as a sole trader. On the opposite scale, we're looking at company as a limited company. If you set it up as a limited company straight from the word go, then your growth possibilities are going to be endless. Investors are going to be a lot more willing to invest in your company and they're going to see that you have been running it profitably for a while. And especially if you manage to get other people involved and other people on board from the first day, that they know that your business is not just you. If the business is not just yourself, your name, the business involves other people and that gives them more comfort and peace of mind to be able to invest in your business. And if we're looking at the personal liability tolerance and risk management, we know that as a sole trader, you are, you are liable for all debts and all claims that are going to be put through to your business. Whereas with a limited company, you're only liable to the amount of amount money that you've invested into your business. So there is a limited liability from the owner's end. So that gives you a little bit more peace of mind as a business owner that you are only a director of a company that, that no liability, or at least you're gonna have limited liability against you should anything happen to the business. Obviously, running a limited company is a lot more costly than running a sole trader business. The limited company requires, requires a lot of initial costs, a lot of maintenance costs, as I mentioned, the auditor's fees, the separate bank accounts, and the limited company also requires a lot of adherence to the law, okay, adherence to the legal requirements. So how would you choose between setting up a, as a sole trader or a limited company? So this all depends on your plans. And this is why it's so important for you to set up a business plan when you are running your business. Now, of course, it's not a requirement for a sole trader, but it's a huge requirement from me as a business coach, if you're trying to really make a go of a business that's going to be profitable, that's going to set you up for life and that, that you're going to have credibility in also in your industry because you're going to be running things properly and running a business plan, setting up a business plan is going to set you up understanding what your goals are, what your unique selling proposition is, where you stand in the industry and how you're going to be selling to your target market. That's going to give you that that foundation that you so need to set up a successful and profitable business. So if you're looking at scaling your business and perhaps you're looking at opening up a studio with 10 reformers and you know that you don't have the finances to set up this business. So you look at perhaps seeking out investors and this is the chance for you to set up your limited company. It takes a lot of work in getting all this organized and getting that credibility, but it is possible. It is possible. And if you need help in trying to identify how to set this up, how to get the finances, and there are many ways of doing this nowadays. You know, many countries also offer business loans. The governments offer business loans. So it's something that you can consider on your own as a sole trader or setting up a company where you have that limited liability, you have the peace of mind of having the limited liability and yet getting perhaps other people on board to share responsibilities. If you do need advice about this, I'm very happy to get on a free discovery call with you. We'll be able to discuss some whether I can help you, whether I can help your business and your visions and perhaps see whether we can find investors for you, for your business and make your dream come true. And if I can't help you, I promise you that I will try and find the best person to help you and your situation. And if we can't do that either, then I'll guide you to the best sources, free sources, free resources online that are going to support you in your vision. If you like this video, guys, hit the like, subscribe, and don't forget to ring the bell so you get notified every time I upload a video online. Until my next video, goodbye for now.